Um, yeah, so uh, it's sort of like uh, it's 360 degrees for me because I worked on this project, as Natalia said, back in uh, 1995 when I was a lot, lot younger, a lot younger. Um, so look, first I do a company overview. You know, our business is all about making money for shareholders. We've got a lot of assets which have been picked up very cheaply, but we haven't been able to, or previously been able to get them into production. Uh, previous people have tried, but unfortunately nickel price thwarted them uh, a couple of times. But obviously, as we've heard today, the outlook for nickel is so different for all, for all the battery metals, and, and we hopefully will benefit from that significantly through the ability to actually get one or more of our projects into production. We've got 400,000 tonnes of nickel in resource. Um, we've got two processing plants, one that can treat up to two million, just over two million tonnes at, at Black Swan, and we've also got one at Lake Johnson, one and a half million tonnes. Replacement cost of those today would be in the hundreds of millions of dollars and, and also take a number of years to, to actually permit and then build and get into production. We've also got a little a gold tailings operation or potentially operation which could generate some free cash for us. And we're, all, we're looking towards being in production next year. That's our target. And it's primarily focused around the Silver Swan asset, but we've also got the other assets which I'll talk about as well. Uh, board, there's been some changes in Poseidon in the last couple of years. Derek LaFerla, who's come on, he's the chairman of Sandfire. Uh, he's a lawyer by training and a very experienced uh, non-exec director myself. Uh, Dean Hilderbrand representing our major shareholder, Black Mountain, who've got about 20%. Felicity represents the forest interest with about 13%. We brought Peter Michelli on board. Uh, we wanted to have some uh, exploration uh, experience on the board. Peter, everyone would know Peter. Uh, uh, had been at Mincor for many years and was instrumental in the discovery of the Cassini asset, which they're currently developing now. Peter's gone out on his own and he's involved in a number of other companies, but he's on our board, which is great. And Brendan joined just before I did. Brendan's a lot of experience in, um, in mining projects and in base metals specifically. Uh, our capital structure, uh, because we've been around for a long time, uh, we haven't been around since the 1960s. The, the, the company name has been. A lot of people in this room probably themselves or their parents or their grandparents made or lost money out of Poseidon. The original Poseidon was 1969 Poseidon boom. The Windara asset is actually the same asset. This company was actually previously called Niagara Mining uh, and it changed its name back to Poseidon uh, which was available strangely back in the, in the 2000s. And so when Andrew Forrest first got involved, uh, the name was changed back to Poseidon, uh, which has got a, an interesting history in terms of the, uh, the nickel business in Western Australia. Um, the share price is around seven cents. That's giving us a market capitalization day of just around $200 million. And we've got about, we had about $15 million in cash which is enough to do the work that we're going to do that, that I'll describe in a minute. Uh, I mentioned before our major shareholders. Uh, we've got a lot of uh, high net worth on the register uh, and we trade somewhere between about 5 and 15 million shares a day. So it's quite an active market in our stock. Uh, and as like most of the previous uh, presenters have put up, if we put a share price up against the nickel price, it almost is a one-to-one -one correlation. I think uh, if I just go back to that slide, you can just see down, down the bottom the the blue uh, is our share price and the grey is the nickel price. You can see almost a one-to-one. -one. We just It just jumps up there when you have a discovery, which is nice. Um, so the nickel market. I won't talk too much about that because most of the presenters have already covered it. But I think the, the thesis is, is accepted now that everyone is going electric. And it's probably going to happen a lot more quickly than actually people did anticipate. And some of the stuff that we have seen really indicates that the market is... is is gaining momentum. And this slide in particular is really encouraging. It's from Glencore's presentation a few months ago. And the second, this is all the, ma the battery minerals, so battery metals, copper, zinc, uh, cobalt, uh, and nickel. And you can see there that nickel, currently the, 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 the world demand for nickel is about two and a half million tonnes. And about 70% of that goes into making stainless steel. And up until now, stainless steel has been the major market for, for nickel. When I first started in, in, in nickel 30 years ago, the world demand was about a million tonnes and compound stainless steel growth is about 5% per annum. So that's where all the growth has come from. All of a sudden now you've got stainless steel still growing at 
uh, and all the, the current demand increase just recently has been out of that resurgence of stainless steel demand out of China through the, uh, the, the work of the government there to get the stimulus going again. But we've got this battery thematic coming through and Glencore is saying that by 2050 there'll be, it'll be nearly 10 million tonnes a year. So that's a, nearly a four time increase. And I don't think anyone really knows where that nickel is going to come from. And so you are going to need, as I've said there in that presentation at the bottom, you, you need a higher incentive price. And, and that's what drives investment. But banks get comfortable that the nickel price is not going to be $4 again. It's going to be sort of 8 to 10 or $12. And then other projects can come on stream. And that's what the, the battery manufacturers need. And that's what the car manufacturers need. They need more nickel supply because it's got to get up to 10 million tonnes and then hold that and keep growing. And that's only in the next uh, less than 30 years. So incredible growth rate. And a lot of nickel will have to come on stream from laterite, sulphides, you know, um, recycling, and you're going to need a higher price to bring some of these lower grade deposits on stream. So it's what happened in copper, uh, it's what happened in a lot of other commodities as well, and we're, we're going to see it dramatically happen in, in nickel. Um, and, you know, someone mentioned before about uh, the, the UK, we were talking about it at the breakfast this morning, um, already Land Rover switched over and said they're going to be producing no internal combustion motor cars within the next four years. So by 2025, which is actually only three and a half years really, they're going to have no in internal combustion engines and all electric. And in the UK, you won't be able to buy a new uh, or produce an uh, internal combustion engine five years after that. So all these um, government initiatives and all the clean energy, all the ESG, it's just all going electric. So um, cars first, then trucks, then boats, uh, underground mining equipment, it's all going to go electric and it's all going to happen very, very quickly. The technology is there and what's just happening now is all the OEMs just getting, you know, switching over their production. And if you're a car manufacturer and you've invested billions of dollars into an engine plant, you don't really want to have to not reap the benefits of that. But the, the, the market is forcing you to do that. So we're now seeing something like $500 billion worth of OEM investment shifting into electric vehicles. So that's the thematic is, is there and we know it's going to happen. So how are we going to make money for our shareholders out of that thematic? Well, we're going to do it by utilising our existing assets. That's the Silver Swan or the, the Black Swan plant. And I mentioned before, you know, to build one of those today, it's a 2 million tonne plant. Also sitting inside of that is the original 150,000 tonne plant that we built nearly 30 years ago, still sitting there on care and maintenance. There's also the 600,000 tonne plant, which was taken from Forestania, and, and put there by Lion Ore. And then when Narils came along and took over Lion Ore for $7 billion uh, back in the last nickel boom, uh, this plant was expanded again to just over 2.2 uh, two, uh, two, 2 .2 million tonnes. To replace all that today, I think, and there, I, I think there's some engineers in the room, you're probably talking $200 million plus and probably three years. And I don't know where you're going to get all the people to build it at the moment either. But So, you know, that's an asset that sits there. To turn that back on again, probably somewhere between 20 and $30 million to refurb that plant. We're actually having that reviewed right at the moment. Uh, we're actually also looking at what it would cost us to get the smaller plant going in as well. They've been sitting there for about 10 years, but they're in remarkably good condition for plants that have been sitting idle for, for 10 years. The, the project uh, goes back, as I said, to the 1990s. Um, we produced, when, when I started working for MPI, we got Silver Swan going in a couple of years and we were producing a high-grade nickel concentrate. Um, all up, the project has produced nearly 200,000 tonnes of nickel over its sort of 15-year mine life. Um, it went through a number of owners, as I mentioned before. Existing resources there, there's a very large low-grade uh, deposit. Um, there's about 180,000 tonnes at about 0.7 nickel. At current prices, it would be sort of marginal to treat that. Uh, but as the price ramps up, and we don't have to go much higher than where we are today, and that project would be very profitable. There's already been a full feasibility study done on that, uh, and back a couple of years ago, the previous management were about to, to press the button on that project, but then the nickel price dropped away, and they certainly made the right decision not to pull the trigger on that project. Uh, and they obviously didn't know about the high-grade deposits at that time. Um, the focus that we're going to look at now is how can we get this project to generate cash without, putting out, without spending too much money, and the, the focus is on the high-grade. So I go back to 1995, some of the people in the room will recognise some of those people. The guy in the middle is David Burt, who was my exploration director at the time, and that's the discovery hole at Silver Swan. So that was a, uh, a follow-up hole based on a, an old open file report that had been done by Anglo where they drilled a hole 
about 200 metres below surface and come up with about 2% nickel and had followed it up. Uh, David organised um, for that drilling to be done in May of 1995. We were a private company at the time. Uh, that, that intersection was 14% nickel in situ. And in five months, uh, we drilled out with two rigs a 440,000 tonne resource averaging 14% nickel, 62,000 tonnes of nickel. Uh, if you put that through the concentrator today at $8 a pound and 75 cent exchange rate and applied a 85% recovery factor, which is what, roughly what we used to get at Silver Swan, and, uh, and you go about an 80% payability, which is probably currently about what the smelters are paying people, that little asset, which took five months to discover and drill out, would make a billion dollars. A billion dollars. A billion dollars. I mean, it's just an incredible... People just don't realise, you know, and David said it to me, my previous boss said it to me, grade is king, and certainly with something like nickel, 14% nickel, uh, with an, an ore body like that. And if we can find another one of those, or half one of those, you know, that's going to be fantastic for our shareholders. And we're very much hoping that Golden Swan is leading us in that direction. So 12 months ago, we put a drill hole into a very weak EN anomaly, and that bottom hole, 7.5 metres of 8% nickel, and our share price, we announced it, and our share price didn't move. It was 3 cents, and it stayed at 3 cents. We then had COVID, we went into lockdown, we sent the rig away. The rig came back again, and it drilled the second hole, 9 metres of 10%, our share price doubled. So all of a sudden, people started thinking, you know, um, one hole, mm-hmm, two holes, that's interesting. Then we drilled the third hole, 6.4 at nine, and people started to realise we were onto something. We then did the EM plate, and we came up with about 170 metres vertical by about um, uh, 60 metres horizontal, uh, true widths between sort of three and four metres, and people started to think, oh, there, there could be something here, uh, as did we. So what we then did is we put a, uh, a, a drill drive in there. It's about 1,000 metres below the surface. We've only recently finished that. And uh, we've then started a drill program. A drill program. It's about 60 uh, holes, about 13,000 metres. It's well underway. And the idea is to drill out Golden Swan and get it up into a, a resource, then hopefully a reserve, and then I'll put it into production. That's the plan. So the drill drive has been completed. It was about 500 metres of, of drill drive. Um, it was uh, done very quickly by a local group, which was fantastic. Uh, the drilling is underway, as I said. Uh, and the only thing at the moment that's holding us up is the assay. The, the laboratory is, is behind schedule. Uh, you know, they've, they've got so much work on and everyone wants it done yesterday. It's three to four weeks and there's no way you can seem, seem to in, you know, reduce that timetable. So we're just waiting for some assays so that we can update the market with regard to the, the drilling. Um, as far as the metallurgy is concerned, we did some preliminary work on that. We were getting plus 90% recoveries to a plus 13% concentrate with incredible iron MGO 50 to 1. Now, this is really important because as sulphide nickel projects have developed over the years, there's less and less of this low, uh, high iron, low MGO. It's switched the other way. So all the smelters around the world are desperately looking for concentrates that they can blend with some of these higher MGO concentrates to actually uh, get their balance right. BHP here in Western Australia, uh, the old Harry Valters melter where this material used to go to, similar. So everyone's looking for feeds like that and there's not many concentrates that I've seen in my 30 year career that have got a 50 to 1 iron to MGO ratio. So that's something that's going to be really help us in our negotiations whether we sell ore or concentrate uh, because that's going to be a real sweetener for the guys that have got problems with their, their iron MGO ratios which is, which is most smelters around the world that take third party feed. Um, so in terms of what we're looking at doing we could actually we could sell ore, we could uh, sell, uh, we could treat concentrate that through the small plant, the 150,000 tonne plant, um, or we could maybe even take some ore, put it through a, um, some type of ore separator um, or uh, up to upgrade that material as well. And so we're looking at all of those paths at the moment. And the timetable for that is uh, basically the next six months. So we want to finish the drilling by the end of July, do all the feasibility study work. We're talking to the market at the moment about direct shipping ore, concentrate terms. We'll do all of that work and have a financial investment decision hopefully by the end of this year, that's the plan. And then if it all stacks up, the nickel price stays where we think it's going to, the terms are right, the ore body hangs together. We're talking about being in production by about the middle of next year. That's our, that's our target. Uh, and that would be from the, from the golden swan ore body only. That's the, that's the plan. And then we could look to bring in what's left at Silver Swan 
and anything else that we might find in this very, very prospective area, which we call the, the Southern Terrace. So it's a wonderful opportunity. We've got all the existing infrastructure is there, as I mentioned, underground mine, processing plant, all the infrastructure we need. And all we have to do is just develop down to Golden Swan and we could be mining. And that would not take more than about six months from decision to mine. So wonderful opportunity. So um, everyone remembers the old KTEL ads where they used to talk about you can have this product and that product, then there's the steak knives. Well, we've got the steak knives here at Lake Johnson. This is another asset that I mentioned, which is an old lion ore asset that uh, became part of the uh, Norilsk assets. They've mined a lot of nickel here, some high grade 3.5% material from Emily Ann. Then they went low grade. Um, there's still about 52,000 tonnes of nickel at just over 1.5%. There's been a, a restart study also done on this plant, which is not expensive. Uh, and we could get that in production again reasonably quickly as well. And at these prices as well, it would be interesting. So we're also looking at the optionality here. We've had approaches to joint venture this asset. We've thought about spinning it out. We've thought about trade selling. And all of those options for us are on the table at the moment. What we really have to understand is how valuable this asset is. And we think that there's a lot of potential. There's about a 14 uh, kilometre strike there. There's lots of high grade material, as I mentioned, that's been mined. There's been some targets that have been drilled that came up with plus 3% nickel. So we really need to do some work on this. And we've got New Exco, who we use a lot, uh, doing a full sort of technical review of all the data to really come up with all the targeting, prioritising all those targets, and then try and work out how much money we would need to spend. Now, is it $5 million? Is it 10? Is it $15 million? And that would really help guide us into terms of you know, what we're going to do with this asset. Do we hang on to it and do that work ourselves? Do we JV it? What do we do? But as, as I said before, our primary focus is getting Golden Swan or the Silver Swan asset into production so that we can generate our own cash flow so that we, we can fund our internal activities. Mount Windara, I mentioned at the start, was the old Poseidon asset, which was developed by Western Mining. Uh, unfortunately, that mill's not there, but what we could do is we could truck ore from there down to Black Swan. So that's an option we have as well. Um, this was discovered back in 69, mined between 74 and 80, uh, about 8 million tonnes at about 1.5% uh, nickel. Um, there's still about 140,000 tonnes there in the two resources, uh, plus there's the gold tailings, which we're doing a feasibility study on as well. Uh, we are going to seriously have a look at whether we could truck ore either up to Leinster, which is not very far away from this asset, and, and sell it to BHP, or bring it down to Black Swan and maybe put it through the larger concentrator uh, if and when we recommission that. So a lot of optionality there. So what's the future hold for us? So in the next 12 months is really critical for this business, primarily driven around getting that uh, golden swan uh, drilling done and hopefully putting out a maiden resource and then obviously a reserve. And finishing that offtake work that we're doing, do we, do we produce concentrate, do we sell ore? Uh, obviously, BHP are a, a potential customer there. Uh, there are other customers as well. Um, and get that FID, FID, FID to the board and, and hopefully approved by December or earlier if possible. We want to continue to drill test the Southern Terrace. I haven't talked a lot about that, but fundamentally there's a huge area that sits around Golden Swan, which we're calling the Southern Terrace, which could be mineralised. And if you look 300 metres away, you've got the Silver Swan system, which is nearly 200,000 tonnes of high-grade nickel mined from underground. I'm talking plus 5% in situ, with as high as 14% from Silver Swan. You've got a wonderful opportunity to find another one of those with all that infrastructure right next to you. You've got the ability to potentially get um, uh, Mount Windara back into production again, sell the ore or truck it down to our own facility, and we've got that optionality at Lake Johnson as well. You know, there's just so much on our plate, we just have to focus on one thing, and that's the Golden Swan asset. That's it. Thanks very much.